your calling doesn't just have to be in the pulpit. Your calling just doesn't have to be in the choir stand. Your calling just doesn't have to be behind the piano and the organ and the drums. Your calling is whatever God is giving you to help make a positive change in this world today. And as long as you're going about that, then you are walking in your calling. What up? It's your boy Blue Magic, owner of Fully Aware and one half of the Mixed Tag Show. Now, I know you've seen the announcements for some of your favorite podcasts in the wrestling. I've decided to expand my business to become a vendor so that people from the wrestling community have a better way to communicate with some of their favorites. So check out FourYourWay.com and see if your favorite podcast on wrestling has partnered up with me. If not, let them know that they should. Also, if you're looking for a vendor for your merchandise, reach out to me at Blue Magic Grind Spell House Down on Twitter and Instagram or at For Your Wear, F O R U R W A R, on Twitter and on Instagram. Shout out to Brian H. Waters and Breaking Through Glass Film. Their merchandise are already up and they're one of the first ones that supported. So go support them. All right? Peace. To my fellow podcasters out there, you ever do a show where you find that you and your guests have so much in common that happened here today good friend of mine ronnell hunt in the wrestling world we know him as the reverend ron hunt is someone who is in the media business he's in the wrestling business he's a drummer but during this podcast i learned that paths are very similar now i didn't get the ring but what I learned is that we actually started playing drums around the same time, same age, I should say. And I'm very excited for y'all to hear this conversation because Rev came through and dropped a lot of gems that I promise you'll have a lot to digest. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, coming up, here's my conversation with Ronnell Hunt. All right, ladies and gentlemen, on the line today, I'm really excited to uh, welcome a good brother of mine, a good friend. Um, you don't find too many friends in wrestling, but, you know, I will say that I welcome him into my circle that I call friends, and that is the brother, Ronnell Hunt. We're going to call him Rev today. I know that's his wrestling name, but he's still Ron Hunt. Ron, how you feeling today? Man, I'm blessed to Holly Flavor, man. How about you, brother? <laughs> You like man. that Holly Flavor? <laughs> oh, that's a coffee with Rev right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Oh man, yeah, I, I'm, I'm blessed, man. You know, the last time uh, we saw each other in person, um, you got jumped, and I had to wear some Crocs. We'll, we'll yeah, talk about my, that. My, my condolences to that. <laughs> no, it's all good. I know you did your best, and I, I even tried to, you know, uh, make sure you could hear the count. But you know, you, you was nursing an eye injury, uh, you know, but. You know, let's break the fourth wall. And, you know, today we're going to talk about, you know, everything that you do, because I'm excited that, you know, obviously wrestling fans will tune into this podcast, even though it's, you know, it's the inspirational side and about the people and their stories. But I'm excited about the people who aren't wrestling fans that's going to listen to this because they're going to get to know how you are like one of the most versatile people out there. And, you know, you are a communication specialist, a mm -hmm. producer, a broadcaster, in addition to wrestler, Mo, might as well say a drummer as well. <laughs> How in the world do you balance everything out? Man, uh I, I I tell you this, man. I made I made a promise to God and God God pulled my bluff on it, man. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been I've been super blessed, and I always said, you know, God, if you just give me the energy to do everything that I do, I'm gonna try to do it for your glory. And uh, he said, "All right, big bet, big bet," and he pushed me to those limits, man. Uh, but I've been I've been very fortunate. I think everything that I've really looked at, um, I've been looking at how I can use it to just bring more focus and more edification to him. And at the end of the day, that's that's the main thing. So believe it or not, man, people ask me, man, like Ron, what don't you do? I'm like, man, I do everything but sleep. But uh, he he gives me the energy to do it, and I I just keep pressing, man. I just keep pressing. Yeah, I love it, bro. I love it. Um, so uh, let's talk about broadcasting first, and, and you know, journalism and communications. Um, you went to Theo College. When did you know that this was a field that you wanted to get into? Yeah, so it was one of those things. Um, re really, I wanted to major in computer engineering, believe it or not. Um, and I was looking at a couple of colleges. I was looking at three colleges when I narrowed down to it, and that was Youngstown State University, 
uh, Slippery Rock University, and then Till College. And um, process of elimination, I was playing football at that point too. So I was looking at between, okay, what, what has a good football program, but then also what has a good academic program. Uh, the last college, the last university I looked at was Slippery Rock. And they said, hey, just pick a minor. You know, we have, they had a bunch of uh, vending tables around. They said, pick a minor that you're interested in, just in case you might want to pick up a minor as well as a major. So I go over to this, uh, go over to this camera, go up to this, to this uh, table. I see this camera, I look into it. Then I see a TV on the table. I see myself. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I started talking to some people. Um, and then it really didn't dawn on me that slowly but surely there were certain things that were placed in my life, even when I was younger, um, that I think kind of made that be the final sign that I was like, maybe I should pursue this career. Um, and, and I would say anything from, you know, going to different community events and being on the news when I was younger and, and doing different things like that, just being a person that they talked to. And then now looking at that, I said, I want to do that. I want to be a face out there for people that look like me and be a representation. And um, and fast fast forward, I think that's what really locked it in. And, I, and ever since then, I was like, I need to do this and I'm going to find a way to do this. And and literally the rest is history, bro. Man, that's that's amazing. Now you um you grew up in the Pittsburgh area, right? Absolutely. Okay, I ain't gonna hold that against you. No, um, <laughs> hey, 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 I wasn't gonna try to hold Baltimore against you, man, but you know, hey. <laughs> no, this is funny because a good good friend of mine, uh Keith Reed, who's uh Pittsburgh through and through, man, and he went to cop in every chance he get. He go, I'm like, Baltimore, the city that educated you in, in secondary education, and hey, you always, you know, job in the city. Trash, man. That's what we do, man. <laughs> we talking with the best. Oh man, you know, it's a I've been up there, um, played, I had to play at a church up there. Man, that was in 2006, man. We had we had a real good time. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I, there's a lot of stuff there. I was like, wow, this kind of looks like Baltimore in certain yeah. areas and especially in the um, suburbs. But, um, you know, uh, now you was a production specialist at WPXI TV. So did you have to go through the journey um, of traveling? You know, most young journalists and producers, people in this field, they got to go, you know, run around the ropes before they can come. No pun intended. Before they can, you know, kind of be closer to home. How, did you have to do that? Yeah, to to a little bit of an extent. And I and I was very fortunate to not have to go to some of the levels that a, a lot of my colleagues and, and friends had to go. Um, I worked at two of our stations. My very That was my very first position, uh, per se, my foot in the door uh, within the news industry was starting as a production specialist, a production assistant at uh, WPXI. And, um, and and that was cool because honestly, that was the news station that I grew up on as a kid since I was born. Uh, so to be able to have my first job there, even though I knew I wanted to be a news reporter at one point, just to have my foot in the door and learn from people that I watched growing up literally since I was in diapers, um, that was very humbling and, and very cool for me. And, and, and um, no one that I worked with had an ego. They were there to help you. They said, hey, you know, they, I was talking to them during commercial breaks or between shows and them just sharing their experiences with me. And um, after that, I, uh, I left from there and I went to uh, a station called KDKA. They were a CBS affiliate in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I did a producer apprenticeship there because then I wanted to learn outside of the college realm how to write. Uh, and produce stories in the sense of the real world. And then uh, and then from there, I went to West Virginia, and then West Virginia to uh, Ohio and Dayton, Ohio. Um, and so, so I did have to go to a few states between Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. Uh, but when you look at that, those are all partnering states within Pennsylvania. So I was very fortunate that the furthest that I had to move, I was about four and a half hours away. When some people, as you know, Brian, you know, would have to go 10 hours, 15 hours and live yeah. there and, and do two to three years, you know, and, and kind of work their way back to hopefully they could come back around if their hometown is a big market that they want to lay in. And um, but you, you still have to make the necessary jumps. And um, I think that every opportunity that I had to make those particular steps, they all had an important focus in my life and, and helped make me into the journalist that I am today, honestly. 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things I'm glad you brought up was um, learning how to write for TV. And what would you say to, like, the younger students listening who are trying to figure that out? Because, you know, you get to it one way, and then, like, I know for me, when I was at ESPN, I was like, all right, now I got to write a shot sheet. And it was more direct, yeah. but still, it was annoying because it's like, all right, first <laughs> and 10, he drives the, you know. So what would you say as far as that's concerned, making that transition? Yeah, I, I would say just keep your mindset open. And I think anything that has to deal with change or when you're looking at doing something that per se is uh, a little bit beyond your comfort level, it can get frustrating, uh, especially in the TV industry and any type of media industry. It can get very um, intimidating if you allow it to be. But that's all a part of the learning curve. And I, and I really do feel like uh, you cannot find yourself properly growing until you find yourself in one of those tried and approved atmospheres to where you're pushed to your limit. And maybe you're learning some things on the go and you have no other choice but to learn it on the go. But I think that's all a part of the learning journey. That's all a part of, of, of helping you grow as a journalist or whatever you want your occupation to be within the media field. So what I try to tell, you know, some of our young people today or people that might be looking to break into it at a, at a, at a latter age in a portion of their life, uh, never say never, keep your mind open, but, and also keep your faith, keep your faith because it's going to be hard. But I, I promise you, if you stick to it, you're going to be better at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, man. Um, you know, one of the things I love what you did and cause you know, I have been trying to, you know, schedule things and I knew that I wanted you on this show. You've been on wrestling yeah. for the culture on the wrestling realm. I, and you know, but I knew I wanted you on this show. And it was kind of like a reminder when you posted on Twitter. <laughs> you said, uh, you get this now. <laughs> like, yeah, because it was like, all right, I'm gonna get the run. I'm, I'm gonna reach out to him, reach out to him, you know. And obviously, you know, you doing coffee talks with Rev. I'm usually in the gym. Yeah. But yeah. like I said, it was just a reminder, like, go do it. Like, you know, but you posted your uh do it now. Yeah, you posted your stats, man. You, 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 your jerseys, you know, you you like look. Y'all, y'all see the wrestling stuff, but let me yeah. tell y'all, Emmy nominated, you know, a producer, on air talent, you know, what's been like some of your favorite stories you got to work on? Yeah, I would, I would say honestly, um, first, first of all, one of the biggest opportunities that that I had is uh, doing an interview with Tyra Banks, and um, that will forever, that will forever be up there. I think you're looking at a at a at a woman that that's been a mogul in her own way, shape, and form. Uh, one that has not only transcended the fashion industry, but the entertainment industry as a whole, let alone being a black woman to be able to do that. So I think for people and for our culture, um, that really spoke wonders um, that many people didn't really think about him, how she was able to transcend herself and, and grow herself and then be an example for, for people of color. Um, so to be able to do that and then just to be able to, uh, as you know, Brian, from talking to different people that are at certain levels, uh, it's one thing to be able to talk to them, but it's another thing to be able to talk with them. And they're treating you like an equal. And I think at any time that you can speak to a high profile person like that, and it really shows their class, even when the camera is not rolling, that leaves a memory in and of itself uh, and a level of respect in and of itself. So so I would say, you know, um, that was one of the biggest ones. Uh, I think another one of the biggest ones, unfortunately, uh, I was working in Dayton, Ohio, when the George Floyd protests happened. Uh, I really think that that opened up a lot of ears, and I felt very honored and humbled to help be a voice for my community, um, for to be able to use my position to tell the story of the community, tell the hurt of the community, but at the same time, talk to um, historical city leaders and, and government leaders and uh, religious leaders and say, hey, this is how we're looking to solve this problem, or this is what's happening in the community to let our voice get out there more and have that resonate to a diverse and a wide diverse range of viewers. Mm -hmm. um, th those type of things, you know, it's easy to get caught in emotion when you're working your typical nine to five and say, hey, I just got to get this job done. But when you sit down at night and you think about it when it's all said and done and you get the breathe, you're like, wow wow, I've really been blessed with this opportunity to do this. And, and sometimes it can be daunting, man, but there, there's been so many so many stories like that regarding uh, entertainment or, you know, regarding very serious 
um, you know, nationwide national news that you look back at it, you're like, man, I can't believe that I'm able to do this and get paid to do this. And, but you love what you do. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's man, it's, it's a blessing, brother. It, it really is. Yeah. I and mean, what's it like a lot of times, you know, because we see you as a, in the wrestling world, right? We see you yeah. as like the, you're the COO, you're the one who, the businessman, you, and, 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 you know, a lot of times with people who don't, aren't wrestling fans, one thing, you know, I'm pretty sure they heard of people like The Miz, uh, who is really just himself turned up to notches. And that's the thing, like, you know, listen to you talk, um, that's what you are, you know, in the ring, your character, and, and you know, with Shane Taylor Promotions, is negotiating, making things happen, making sure the price is right. Yep. In a sense, you are negotiating for the people, being the voice of the voiceless. Yeah. Um, what's that responsibility like? And how do you protect your mental health when you're doing that? No, that that's a that's a great question, man. Um, I, I think when when you look at it, you know, you're you're looking at number one, you always have to be mindful of what the mission is. Um, I often say you have to be mindful of what your goal is, you have to be mindful of what your mission is, you have to be mindful of what your intentions are. And I think so many times you you can get overwhelmed uh, if you don't have those three things in priority. And uh, you, you've heard me say this, especially in the wrestling world. You know, I say, you know, what we're saying right now and what we're doing, this goes much more beyond pro wrestling. It's just we're using the outlet of what we can do as entertainers and as professional wrestlers, uh, as managers, as uh, uh, figures in our industry. Uh, to be able to be the voice for change. And it's the same thing even in what we call the shoot world, in the real world, to where, you know, what I'm able to do, what are my intentions? Let me be mindful of of where my mindset is and what my intentions are so that I'm going about it the right way. And uh, so when you look at it, you know, it is a lot of weight. Now, with that weight, just like you said, there also comes – that 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 mental side of things the the part that gets very taxing the part that uh it begins to drag you down and uh one one of the things that i tell people and and the name the reverend hunt is there because that that's a part of my faith journey um you know one one of those main things is just staying grounded um staying grounded and for me i look at it not only being mindful of who you are but whose you are and um, and, and that's been one thing that's, that's been with me, man, that that faith journey of me understanding that, listen, you know, you've been appointed to do what you've been doing for a reason. Um, I tell people in our church, um, your calling doesn't just have to be in the pulpit. Your calling just doesn't have to be in the choir stand. Your calling just doesn't have to be behind the piano and the organ and the drums. Your calling is whatever God is giving you to help make a positive change in this world today. And as long as you're going about that, then you are walking in your calling. And so for for me, that's been one of the main things, me understanding that, you know, while I do believe that I have a responsibility, I know that I'm not in this alone. And it's okay for me to understand that I cannot handle things alone. And so with, with me, you know, wake up every day and, and pray and, and be thankful, uh, be grateful. I think that that's the mentality of, uh, getting into the mindset of looking at not saying I have to, but saying I get to. And and I think that goes into a mindset of being a slave to the rhythm. If I'm always looking like, man, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. You are mentally dragging yourself of just going through the motion. But if you look at it as an opportunity of, no, I get to do this. I get an opportunity to do this. You are putting your mindset in a go-getting mentality of already setting yourself in a mindset to win and get after it instead of dragging yourself just through another day and going through the same motion. Uh, so that's been that's been just a couple of things that's really been helping me keep grounded, keep mentally rooted, and stay on that stay on that right path. But then at the same time, being comfortable with saying it's okay to not be okay. And I feel especially, you know no matter what walk of life, but especially within the black community, uh, we have been so brainwashed to say, uh, you know, as guys, I right, just suck it up, you know, crown your own. Don't let nobody see you like that. And, and we carry that into adulthood. And then, so we don't feel like it's okay to not be okay. 
and we keep things bottled up and then we try to handle it on our own and we can't handle it on our own. So it bottles up even more. And then now you have a negative cycle of these things continuing to happen mm. and we get no resolution. So, so those, those are, those are the main things, man. Surround yourself with a circle of accountability partners, but then also be mindful of not only who you are, but whose you are. Wow, man. That, that might be the name of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, you ain't got to pass the plate on that one, brother. <laughs> um, you know, looking at, um, so let's talk about you, uh, you know, your music and playing drums, because that also ties into broadcasting. We'll get to, when did you start playing drums? Started playing drums at the age of five, man. Started Me too. Playing, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, I mean, I wasn't playing in church, but that was when I, my uncle, shout out to uh, my uncle Troy, who is the, like, the reason that, like, I'm such a huge wrestling fan. So uh -huh. he, by us being, like, 11 years apart, he was like the big brother more so. So he played drums. I wanted to play drums. You know, he would always have the wrestling tapes and like the video games. And, you know, he raised me on like far as like him and my dad played gospel quartet. And that's where I got into it. So you said you started playing five. Was you playing in church at five? Because uh, so I've seen some kid drummers, man. I'd be like, man, oh, hey, they, they nasty. <laughs> prodigies. Yes. Hey, prodigies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not start playing. Now, I discovered the drums in church. Okay. I did not start playing for church until I was probably around about 11 or so. Um, yep. So, so I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I'm a, same I'm a, age, bro. Same yeah, age. Hey, 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 same walk of life. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a PK. I was born mm -hmm. in the church. Um, mm -hmm. I was that type that I would sneak up to the drums after and dab on. Then we get pulled off and we got to leave. And um, I think slowly through the growth, uh, I think it was mm -hmm. one of the services my dad said, hey, can you play for Praise and, Praise and Worship? So they wanted to give me that opportunity. He just gave me a song. I said, cool. Hey, it's like that match. I held my own. Hey, don't, okay. hey, 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 don't, don't go crazy on me. I need to stay in the pocket. This is my yep. debut. <laughs> <laughs> this is my debut. I got to stay in the, the pocket. pocket. Man. That's it. <laughs> You know what that is. You got. I got to yep. stay in that pocket, man. And uh, and then so from there, you know, um, I, I I remember we 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 was after. You know, he's about to go into a, a prayer, and I remember my dad like just gave me like a little nod. I said, "All right, I think I did pretty good, man. I ain't, you know, I I ain't have no congregation members looking like man. Get boy can't now, tune." Now, uh, did your dad play any instruments real quick, or was he just no 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 so, so no no okay. believe believe it or not, he didn't he didn't play any instruments. Now, surprisingly, from I feel like that's where I got my pro wrestling abilities from because he was actually a boxer okay. uh, years ago, dating back in Pittsburgh. And then when he was in the Air Force, he was also boxing in the Air Force. Um, nice. I just took the in-ring sport to a whole nother level. <laughs> um, I, I still came from that ground of uh, um, uh, of being, being an in-ring athlete, even outside of the normal collegiate and the scholastic sports. Um, mm. And, and I, I, stu I, studied, I studied boxing. And I think that's why Shane and I, get along so well as well because we're always believe it or not i think sometimes we talk boxing more than wrestling but um, oh, okay <laughs> it, it's it's crazy man but but yeah so uh that that, that was that 11 years old is when i, I kind of got that that official debut uh for the church service and literally the rest is history after that man man so when, when did you get your first kit Woo! i was 13 yeah okay. that was that was, that was great graduation Yep, I had I had a little I had a little Yamaha, man. I had a little, okay. little Yamaha. I think it's about a four about a four or five set. I think it's about a four set. Uh, something something basic just to kind of get started on. Um, nothing too expensive or nothing like that. And uh, I think my parents regretted it uh, just a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we took it down to the church. Then they didn't have to hear about it in the house. I had to be that in the church. So I was still in the presence of the Lord. So I think <laughs> they knew what they was doing. <laughs> I think they knew what they was doing all along, man. Would you say the drums probably saved you? Um, obviously, you know, as, um, you know, at a young age, right? So we know we get the attention. The drummers yeah. get the attention. So, you know, you hit 15, 16, 17, you know, visiting churches come or you go visit somewhere else. You know where I'm going with this. Yeah. <laughs> See somebody catch your eye. You might do a little bit extra. You know, yeah. shed a little bit, show hey, off hey, a little like, bit. Like spend that stick one time or two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then as you know, you move forward and you get older. Do, will you say like, 
that was uh, something that kind of like helped you stay like rooted and grounded? Absolutely. Um, and and I, I think, you know, in the earlier life and the earlier walk of life, mm -hmm. uh, you have those that, you know, you're really just trying to find your purpose or find your openness in church, um, especially when you're at that that age where you're transitioning out of the being forced there in a Sunday school to now discovering what your purpose is to serve in a capacity in church. Uh, so I was drumming before I accepted my call in the ministry. And for me at that point, and even now when I have the opportunity, um, that is still my form of ministry because now I'm ministering through music. Um, so, so when, for me, I think that that was, uh, me at that point finding the most authentic way that I could give God praise. And, and, and I, I think that that definitely opened me up to him being able to work through me after that. And, and Brian, just as you said, you know, when, when you're a little bit younger, man, especially when it came to, you know, youth group afternoon services, you see a little honey over there, man, mm -hmm. you try to spit the Holy Ghost game, man. <laughs> like I was nervous. I was shy. Me and my girlfriend was talking about it before. We was like, man, we used to get excited and we wasn't saying a goddamn thing. Hey, hey, hey I'll tell, tell you what it is. And every now and then I still do it in wrestling. I, 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 I chew what is called the invisible gum. Mm. That there's no gum in my mouth, but mm. I'm chewing it. I like you. You can't tell me I ain't chewing the world's best piece of gum. I'll be, man, I remember a couple times I'm on, I'm on them drums. I see that girl, I'll be like, <laughs> and I ain't chewing the dog on thing, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's 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 what it is. And every now and then, I catch myself doing it in wrestling, and my family's like, "Ronell, you chewing that man?" I'm like, "Ah, oh, I don't even know I do it anymore." <laughs> but, uh, but so I guess I still I still do it today. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's one it's one of those things that that I, I think you know when you when you look back and when you get older and wiser, mm -hmm. um, you really look back, you realize even then that God is using you for some things. Uh, that even you didn't even understand at that time, but he knew what he was doing the whole time. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, you had some experience working in uh, gospel radio. And, yeah. I, you know, we'll talk about that. And, you know, obviously you you putting two and two together. You, you know, I mean, you're taking two of your passions, you know, the uh, broadcast side, the music side and getting to work in radio. And how would you say that's like helped you on both sides of your career? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, I think I think with me that was a big focus for me, especially um, when when you look at it. And I, and I was fortunate; I actually brought our when I was at Till, I brought our first gospel radio station to that campus, um, which which was an honor. Um, at that time, we lost our FCC license prior to when I got there, and um, I had the opportunity to be assistant station manager. Uh, and help work with the board to get that back. And then I was elevated to station manager after that. And I was station manager for about a good three and a half years. Uh, all the way up till then, I still had to go back. Surprisingly, even after college, because they they broadcast it out. It wasn't just a closed circuit radio station. Um, so to be able to do that, I think that that was one of my main focuses. Um, when I When I was mainly focusing on radio was, how can I combine the best of both worlds? And how, how can I do that? And then helping with one of our radio stations down in um, uh, down in Pittsburgh, uh, WGBN, it was a gospel AM radio station. Um, to be able to do that and combine both passions, it was the easiest thing that I've ever done because you're looking at something that I went to school for and you're looking at something that is also diving within my calling. And so to be able to combine the the both of those and somehow some way just even not even knowing it leaving a word that hopefully someone needed at that point in time when they're listening to your broadcast um i couldn't have i couldn't have had it any, any better than that man that that is incredible man uh okay folks now you can own more breaking through glass ceilings merch not only can you get the breaking through glass ceilings t-shirt but also the no ceilings above your success t-shirt visit foryourwear.com slash brian h oh did i mention we got hoodies now y'all know it's hoodie season so fellas grab your hoodie get an extra one for your ladies as well let's talk about wrestling real quick before we get yeah. out of here uh when did you decide that you wanted to get in the ring. 
That was uh, 1998, believe, mm-hmm. believe it or not, 1998, WCW Bash at the Beach. <laughs> I, I Listen, I remember the show, and mm-hmm. I'll, tell you the, I'll tell you the exact match. Now, believe it or not, there was a stack card. Um, I want I, I know you had uh, I know you had Ray Mysterio on there. You had a few other people on there. Um, the, fun, the funny thing is, I was I swear I was just looking at this card a couple of days ago, and I was like, man, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, let me see. I just I just pulled it up. Yeah, because you had yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. Saturn versus Raven in the in the, in the Raven Ravens Rule match. You had uh, my my boy my boy the Juice man. You had um, oh yeah, movie. Had him and Kidman. Yeah, you had Chavo, Stevie Ray. Uh, then you had Chavo and Eddie, but I tell I tell you I tell you what did it, man. It was it was Eddie and Chavo. It was Eddie and Chavo in that hair versus hair match. And okay. um, I, I I think I think what it was was, um, in particular, it was Eddie. It, it was his presentation, uh, his energy, his desire that he had all the way up until he passed. Um, it was just something about him that gravitated me in. That even watching at home. You just mm-hmm. you felt some type of pull that you were just like, and he just had you. Yeah. And I, I think then is when I went from a fan to that light bulb went off and said, yeah, I, I got to do that. I got I to mm-hmm. be in that ring. I, I, I don't know how, but I have to at least try to do that. And um, so ni- 1998 was when I was like, I need to do this. And uh, but it wasn't until 2011, believe it or not, um, that I had that opportunity. I was going through high school, graduating high school, going into college or so. And um, and it was always that mindset. I was that kid, typical kid. I'm in the backyard where uh, my friends and I were giving each other black eyes, you know, we're putting cardboard on shopping carts and and putting ourselves through shopping carts and all that crazy stuff. And then you turn out that I'm putting Jay Bougie and his girlfriend through a door. Crazy, right? <laughs> right. We'll get to that. But so, 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 uh, two, 2011, man, I, uh, I went down to, uh, Florida for, uh, w, uh, that was a uh, Wild Simone Pro Wrestling Training Center off of the Wild Simone. And, um, I, I made that goal. My parents had some family down there and, uh, they said, listen, we'll be able to help you with the tuition of the school, but you have to promise us that you're going to get your college degree. And I said, that's an easy bet. I was going to do that anyway. So that, that, that ain't even a bet, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so fa- fast forward, man, 2011 was, was when I pulled that trigger. I was down there for about eight months or so. And um, it was one of the toughest, one of the most grueling um, things that I've ever been through. And I did football, basketball, and baseball, football all the way through college. And I still say till to, still to this day, one of the toughest things I've ever done. Um, but I don't, I don't regret it. And, and I think that's what helped make me the performer that I am today, man. But, it all started in 1998. Eddie Guerrero, Eddie versus Chavo, uh, hair versus hair match, man. What, what was it like working with the Wild Samoans? Because, you know, I've heard, like, I mean, they, there's no doubt about it. The greatest yeah. family in wrestling, right? They There's never been a time, what, probably since the 70s, maybe yeah. the 80s, where there wasn't one of them in the WWE. Uh, and like look now as the time of this recording you know for people who listen to this two years later uh the time of this recording roman reigns is on top of the world uh but you got a chance to like work with his dad and his uncle what yeah. was that like man that I, honestly i think it was one of those things that it was it, it's one of those things it was a before and after it was cool and like oh man i get this opportunity before um but then when you're going through the process uh, you don't you don't look at him that way. Um, mm-hmm. That's your coach, you know. That's your pops, you know. That that that's your pro wrestling father that, that's helping to birth your career. Um, these are the people that's helping to pour knowledge and instill that into you. So believe it or not, I was kind of numb to that during the process because you're so focused on just taking in all of this knowledge um, that that they have been given, that they have learned, that they have uh, mastered and made into their own, and they're pouring it back into you. But then also it doesn't click again until after the process. You graduate, you're like, wow, I can't believe that I'm a part of that now. Mm-hmm. I, 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 like, I can't believe that I, number one, I survived all of that. But number two, that I earned the respect um, to be able to do what I do and be able to also carry that name like others that came before, like your, 
your your Dave Batistas, you know, your gang growls. Um, and the the list the list goes on. Um that I think that was the most humbling. I think it didn't hit me until after. Um, but when you're going when you're going through that, you're just locked in. But now looking back at it, um, just as just as you said, right now, respectfully, respectfully, I feel that there is no family that can match the lineage that they can. There are other families that deserve all the accolades that we are giving them. You got, mm-hmm. you know, you got your heart dynasty, you know what I'm saying? You got your Guerreros, you know, um, the, the, the list, the list goes on. But when it comes to the longevity and the power of the longevity and the currency of it, uh, I really do feel like there's no family to match what the Samoan dynasty has done for the pro wrestling world as a lineage. Yeah, and and one of the things I wanted to ask you, and really it's um, I guess to say an alley oop, so people can know, why do you think that now in wrestling people see you more as a manager? I think no, and I see now over this past year you grabbed the brass ring, right? Mm-hmm. You're run four belts, but why do you think people tried to car- compartmentalize you as just? The manager of Shane Promotions and under, uh, Shane Taylor's promotions, understanding like all the importance they mean to the company of that was Ring of Honor at the time. But why do you think you got, um, you know, kind of placed in this bubble? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it was one of those things to where you you don't know if it's one of those things of they don't know what to do with you, or or to a sense of maybe you were too good at a at a particular job and they get comfortable at you completing that particular job. Uh, so then if they don't have to look for extra work, mm-hmm. you get into a plug and play mentality where they're like, Hey, he is great at this. All we got to do is go boop, boop, instead of now trying to figure out a whole regime. Now, uh, when it comes to the, to the in, in ring portion and um, it's been a blessing and a curse. You know, I think a lot of people have always asked me like, do you, do you regret, um, you know, well, why, why don't we see you in the ring? Are you mad? You're not in the ring. And, at the present time, I said, no, not really, because I'm like, it's still the same time. I'm saving my bump card. I'm still on the same shows with my boys. We still make it to do what it do. We still making money moves. Um, but but, you know, at the same time, you know, you're like, hey, if y'all need me to step up to the plate, we can. And I think it really didn't dawn on me because I try not to look at it like, well, you know, I know that I can do this. I know that I can do that. But um, it was pretty humbling to hear from fans you know once they see a match and it might be their match they seen for the first time and they're like yo he can really go and i'm like i've been doing this for years <laughs> you know you know, you know I, I, i've been i've been at it for years but i think it's good to really see and then people asking well well why didn't they do anything with him any any other time you know um and and we we've always had a scrum saying like like i said my boys we have, have always been my boys the way that we looked at it at that time was, hey, um, if ROH wanted to do uh, things the way that they did, just in regards to mainly focusing on the managerial side of things, then so be it. But even during our time when we were at Ring of Honor, uh, when it came to independent shows, uh, we're throwing on six man tags, and I'm and I'm involved right in the middle of it, and in, in places like Dallas, Texas, with with VIP wrestling down there, um, and 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 play in places like like what we've seen. Uh, in uh, Richfield Park, New Jersey, you know, when it when it came to the six man uh, against Takeover, um, you know, just to say like, hey, like this is what you can also have at the same time. Um, but you know, I think it's a fine line of perhaps being so good and and blessed with the gift of gab that they got comfortable with it and realize, hey, we don't really have to move and we could just put him right here and we know he's going to be able to hold his own versus maybe trying to say, do we need to find a whole separate storyline or how do we now bring him in? Because we don't have eight man t- titles and we know that any portion of Shane Taylor promotions is killing it right now, uh, individually and as a team. So it, it's one of those mysteries. It, it, it is, it is, it's really one of those mysteries, but uh, it is always funny. Uh, I think they caught the commentator when you were reffing a match with, uh, with Boozy and I, one of the commentators said, what makes it interesting about it is Ron is not a wrestler. And the guy, I, I, I listened to it, like I said, 
this brother didn't do his homework, man. All you gotta do is type in the Red Run Hunt. These matches gonna pop up. Exactly. But, but, but his other dude corrected him like, no, he's very much a wrestler. He got <laughs> multiple titles, and he's been at this for for a good chunk <laughs> of time. And um, so so to be able to kind of see that, I, I do think it's a blessing and a curse. Number one, it makes it easier for me because I got to do less, and people think that it's amazing because they think, oh, as a manager, he's not that bad. Not knowing how to the scene for ten years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, we, we talked about you know the match with Jay Bougie. I had um uh takeover versus Good STP God. back in um <laughs> back in May. It was uh you know it, you, you talk about the best way to kick off the summer of 2022, man. Uh you know, thank you uh for allowing me to be a part of that. Uh yes, sir, you man. know, a way, dream brother. come true for me personally. You know, I never thought ever I would be referee in a match and it was a very pivotal time in my life at the time. So it was like, man, like this was phenomenal. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm I'm a break, I'm gonna break kayfabe. To see you and John put that together and the exchange of information and respect, you know, one of the things you talk about, uh, can you talk about is giving back in a business that you love so much? Yeah. And just, you know, just talk about, you know, what it means to be able to give back and teach, um, you know, people coming up that, you know, the next generation. Man, it it is it is so crucial. Um, and, that, and that has been the mindset that we've tried to tell people uh, what they have heard. Shane Taylor promotions, both us as individuals and us as a unit collectively say uh, on camera and, and you, you have witnessed it personally. Uh, is is what we do off camera, uh, mm-hmm. behind closed doors. Um, we say if it's if if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Because at the end of the day, we are all we got. And so to be able to be put in a platform to where we can now pay it forward, and we know that our time is far from over. We don't have to wait until we're at the end of our careers to pay it forward. Um, Our whole mindset, and even when we held the six-man titles, was to say, we want to face the best of the best, no matter what the city, no matter what the state is. But our whole overall mission was to get those particular group of people over in their area, put a spotlight on them that perhaps they didn't have at that time, and let more eyes be brought to them so people can see the versatility and the diversity of talent that we have as a culture stretching across the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, And still we believe aren't getting the due credit. Uh, So it's like like I said, it goes back even like what I was talking about the news industry. Um, It is a weight, but it is a weight that we will graciously bear on our back because we understand uh, that not many people um, respectfully and humbly have the opportunity to have the name that we have behind us, the eyes that we can draw, the manpower that we can draw behind us, and then use that to help elevate the next crop of talent that's going to be out there, hopefully are the next stars that you see on your TV uh, with contracts in their hand. So um, to be be able to do that, um, I remember when I was, when I was talking to Shane, (laughs) when I was talking to Shane and all that, I said, Hey, uh roughly around this time what y'all schedules looking like man i might have something for us and they said hey rob man you be you i, I remember O'Shea was like hey rob man you be you be throwing around that chief of operations title man you be setting you be setting some things up in motion i said listen all i gotta all i all i need y'all to say is y'all got it open and we may be in jersey that day i was like the rest will connect and i remember when boozy started tagging them they said ron what are you doing i said don't worry. I, I think we got magic. I was like, just, I was like, trust me on this one. I think we got something good coming. And um, to see where we started based and, th- and then look at the, the final product of it uh, and to be able to see that there wasn't a main company backing that. And that was legit just the passion uh, that two units had to do something for our culture that our culture could be proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there, there's no there's no bigger accolade to that bro we need the rematch 
Man, listen. We need the rematch. You ain't got to. You ain't got to tell me twice. <laughs> I tell him. I'm uh, listen, man. I'm, I'm. I might. I might come with a. Uh, I might come with a torch, man. I don't Uh-oh. know. I might come with one of them flamethrowers and maybe a whole bag of Crocs. Oh boy, yeah. And then light the light them things on fire, man. Because 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 we 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 gonna listen listen. I'm gonna tell you what we gonna do. We're gonna do. We we gonna have a. We're going to have a, a, a foot washing ceremony for you. Now, people that did not see this match, they're probably like, what the world is this brother talking about? But your feet were degraded to wear Crocs. You had on the Fleece Johnson 3000s. You had on the Bethlehem 11s. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> hey, hey, I'll give you that. <laughs> i give you that. You was a man. But I also saw you kick them bad boys off. Yep. I'm about to take a couple of laps in church, though. <laughs> <laughs> Saying so much to need to t- just to tune you up, and you. Mm, 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 mm. Then I got heat with ruthless La La because because I I, I I apparently hit her with one of my shoes, and you know Queen PR was she had my shoes. She you know like a great friend. She she protected because she was the only other person that was with me as far as no crocs if you see the video you actually hear her y'all are like what are you doing what are you doing you know so it was uh yeah it was rough it was rough out there but you know i i, I, pr- I prayed for you Ab. i appreciate it you know that you did not go into a backsliding uh, uh state of mind after that i understand how egregious and and how uh, uh mentally taxing that could be <laughs> um especially when given to you by the croc god Mm-hmm. Uh, now the god of new york um <laughs> but um we i i do want to run that back yeah right? need so, to. so whoever's hearing this take over versus stp 2.0 let's run it back jay bougie i want it back let's make it happen there we go there we go um before we get out of here man um I, you know the title of the show is called breaking through glass ceilings you tell people, when did Ronnell Hunt break through the glass ceiling? When it was the moment that you realized, you know, you talked about, you know, living in your purpose and everything. When was the moment you realized you was living in your purpose? And you, we, you know, some people don't like to say arrive, but you know, I'll say this. You knew you was good at what you was doing. You was doing what you're supposed to be doing. The, 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 moment, the moment that I realized this, believe it or not, um, it was about 2000. There, there, there's two, there's two different glass ceilings for me. I'll, I'll take it that way from the shoot realm. Uh, the moment was when I did the Tyra Banks, um, when I did the Tyra Banks episode, um, that was when they announced her as the host of America's got talent at that time, right before she was taken over for the, for the season. Mm-hmm. And, um, that was actually a trial run. They said, Hey Ron, you know, we're transitioning some things. We just want to, give you this run and i'm like all right cool you know who we talked to like hey don't be nervous i'm like no nah, i'm good um and i said uh what you know we're talking about her being host cool give me like five minutes hit the bullet points and we good you, you know what i'm saying um and then I, I think overall just in regards of having that comfort level um that this is what i've been made to do and then to be able to look at those producers and they're flabbergasted and i'm like I really, I thought that sucked, <laughs> you know? And they're like, no, that was great. That was, that was great. I'm like, I mean, I want to get better. You know, I, I've never been one that's been complacent. Mm-hmm. Um, but but at the same time, um, I think that that dealt with because I knew what I could be. And I think that they would just see where I was and think that was great. But I'm like, okay, you know, if you're saying that, but I know where I can be. And mm-hmm. I was never satisfied with just being great. I wanted to be extraordinary. Um, so I, I would I would say that. And that was around 2012, 2013. I want to say that was, uh, give or take, rough, roughly around there. Um, no, I, actually, sorry, sorry. Short, shortly after that. That might that might have been about 2016 or so. Um, okay. But then in the pro wrestling realm of things, um, that was this whole second tier of the glass ceiling. I want to say that happened around 2015. Uh, I think they were doing the last rendition of Tough Enough that they had had um, uh, Patrick Clark and Leo Russ and, and a few others on there. Um, my parents always told me 
to dress for where I wanted to go. You dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. And I've always been one of those ones that I, I walked that with purpose. Um, so I, when I applied for Tough Enough then, um, I, I did the video. The, the video went through the various uh, stages. Then it got added to the site. Um, and then it got added to the site to being in the early favorites. Uh, to being in the early favorites, to the, the the company is tagging my tweets and everything, and I and I'm talking about some tweets that I was I was saying some crazy stuff. I was calling out Bray Wyatt and stuff like that. And <laughs> it, was, it was on the website. <laughs> wow! I was like, man, this is crazy. Um, uh, two 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 simple things of uh, uh me doing a workout video and and The Rock retweeting and commenting on it, and and I think that that was another glass song which I was like, I've been. I've been made to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I've been made to do this. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, believe it or not, you're probably the first podcast I told this to, believe it or not. Um, uh, I missed being on Tough Enough by one day mm. because I had an email that went to my junk mail. And it was right at the end where they needed one more, they needed one more Zoom call and they were locking everything in. And I was wondering why I didn't hear anything. And I'm checking. I had a couple of different emails. And that's the stupid thing about doing 50 million things. I had like three, four different <laughs> Yeah. Things. And I'm looking through all of them. And I saw it. And I hurried up and replied. I gave her a call. I said, hey, I'm sorry, Ron. They're on a super tight because we're trying to get travel and everything. Um, un unfortunately, like, if you would have got back to us, no lie, probably about 29 hours ago, you would have been in. And, um, and I said, cool. But I tell you what I did then. Um, I had a, a replica World Heavyweight Championship, uh, the big gold one, like we had Flair come out with. I had I had one, um, one of, like one of the good good ones, like the three hundred fifty dollar ones at that point. I don't know what the inflation is now, but um, and at that time I had an NXT hoodie and an NXT mm. T shirt um, because even when I was doing stuff on social media or cutting promos, I wanted an opportunity for whoever was working at that company to already be able to visualize me in being a billboard for their brand and seeing me as a billboard for that brand. Um, I slept with that title every single night. That title was on one side of the bed. Just so that was the last thing I looked at when I went to sleep. That was the first thing I saw when I woke up. And that put me in a whole nother mentality. And then that happened. So I was like, chance. You know, it wasn't for me at that time. I had a few other things that opened up. I stayed in contact with a couple of producers. A couple of things opened up with a few different reality shows. It went through the necessary channels all the way up to the big, big network. They said, uh, you know, if you would have just been like a year older, it would have been this. It would have been that. I said, cool, no problem. Same thing with Ring of Honor. I had a tryout, the same thing. I had a, I had a ROH uh, jacket. A no, a no isn't a never. It's just a not right now. But you fast forward now, I went from a time to where I had an opportunity to where I'm fortunate to just sit at the table where the six-man titles are to fast forward years later. I'm walking my men down to the ring for the biggest pay-per-view of that company as the world's six-man champions. Um, and that's not to say that I had everything, but I think that that was the mindset that I realized what is for you is for you. And can't no one take that away from you. And if God put it in your heart and put it in your spirit that you have been made to do that, don't let anyone discourage you from that. So you break a glass ceiling in news and radio and media and podcasting and being an entrepreneur. You break a glass ceiling and being a wrestler, a commentator, uh, a, a, ring, a ring announcer, a referee, uh, a producer, a timekeeper, whatever, whatever it is. And let no one take that away from you. So those those are two of my glass ceilings, brother. And um, we we still going, man. I think there's still more glass to be broken. Yes, sir, man. Yeah. We gotta. We might have to put the church music on. Uh, that <laughs> <one>. <laughs> <laughs> man, oh man. <laughs> Ron, I definitely appreciate you, man, for uh, coming through. I know Much you know love, you're busy. Um, y'all make sure y'all check out Coffee Talks with rev did i get that right because i know the last time i had the hashtag wrong i'll be bro, there bro you go we call we call it coffee toss man but if they use it just use hashtag coffee with rev 
uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, 7.30 until. I don't, I usually, I used to just keep it like an hour, hour and a half. Now we're pushing average five and a half hour shows. I don't know how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I tell you, a lot of times, I've, you know, I'll be in the gym working out. Listen, I, I, I see you get off for a little bit. Then you go off, and then I'll be seeing you back. And I, I know he's probably like, man, they still in here. Yeah, you know, sometimes a phone call come through, you know, but it, it'd be great. It's great conversations. Yeah. You know, shout out to everybody. You know, shout out to Sloan. Uh, because <laughs> he didn't he hesitate. And I was like, you know what? That's cool. I ain't even mad. Like, only, and nobody else can say it. Just him. Well, but, listen, yeah. I'm, I'm, t- I'm telling you, lucky is just that because I said your H is going to stand for more words than the F and Weezy F. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Like, I, I, st- I stand by that. I'm waiting. They gonna call you. They call you Hezekiah. Uh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, let the people know where they can find you for the ones that's uh, listening and not watching on YouTube. I, absolutely, man. Y'all can find me on Facebook, Twitter at the Rev Ron Hunt. Actually, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, the Rev Ron Hunt. Instagram, the Rev underscore Ron Hunt. You can find all your stuff there. Also, if you're looking for any type of apparel or anything, you can head right on over to What a Maneuver and Pro Wrestling Tees. Just type in the Rev Ron Hunt. You can find all your merchandise and everything there. Uh, then other than that, man, just stay tuned online, man. We got a lot of big things going. You need anything with the crew, just focus on the hashtag Shane Taylor Promotions. You're going to find everything about all the boys over there. There you go. Like, like he said, you know, follow the hashtag, follow Ron. I promise you it'll be a good follow. Ron, I appreciate you, brother. Always a pleasure, Thank man. You, brother, man. Always, man. Anytime you want me on, man, I'm here, brother. Yes, sir.